works at Bangor University in the UK. Today, uh, his topic is do not always look on the bright side on an anti Anglosian view on anti-capitalism and emancipation. It seems uh, to be very interesting theme and uh, we hope that uh, we have uh, very interesting discussions today. So, uh, shall we begin? Please, Marcel. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, yes, this could be very interesting. It's a... Uh, um, the talk that has to do with the concept of history and basically uh, I, th I think it has to do with the question of whether there is a structure or a, a dynamic in history and more importantly whether that is somehow a ground for optimism <laughs> so the talk is really about the concept of optimism and um, obviously in the context of critical theory, by, by which I mean the Frankfurt School and Marx, uh, or, or rather I should say Marx and the Frankfurt School. Uh, so whether there's any ground or, or what is the, the, uh, the ground for optimism concerning emancipation, human, general human emancipation um, in relation to history. So that, that is sort of what, what, what the talk is about, I think, but I'm not entirely sure what it's really about but we, what we will see uh, the starting point and sort of the the immediate subject matter of the talk is a, uh, is a sequence from adorno's minima moralia this is where the uh, or this is what the title alludes to and in particular this sentence the optimism of the left repeats the insidious bourgeois superstition that one should not talk of the devil but look on the bright side uh, I don't know if you know Minima Moralia. It's a it's a set of very short texts. Most I, I think are about 150 or so. Most of them like two pages long. They're sort of very condensed, compressed, abbreviated uh, reflections on, on on all kinds of uh, philosophical uh, questions, s such as this one. Uh, this is uh, section 73, so it's right in the center of the book. Uh, it's in two parts, as is often the case in Adorno's uh, writing, in particular uh, in, in, in that period and, and afterwards, uh, that are sort of almost like contradicting each other. So the first part describes what he calls the official optimism of the adherents of the labor movement at the time, obviously, which seems to increase with the iron consolidation of the capitalist world in the present. The more the totality closes in, the more workers reflect in their consciousness the tendencies of capitalist developments, the more critique thereof is necessary, the more this, this critique is seen as suspicious, suspicious, seen as suspicious by the apparatuses, by the organizations, the parties and, and so on of the labor movement. The official optimism of these organizations points to specific partial reforms, but is revisionist in the sense that it has abandoned all the insights of Marx's critique of political economy. And indeed often speaks not of the critique of political economy, but of a critical political economy, which is already a kind of an indication of the revisionism that is uh, operating there. Marx's conceptions are replaced by empty arbitrary slogans that are basically exchangeable at, at any point. And one uh, with one key characteristic that seems to be quite central to Adorno, certainly in, in this particular text, that is the obligation to be somehow nationalist. So he, he writes, the loyal supporter of any of these organizations must swear allegiance to a people, no matter which. In the dogmatic concept of the people, however, the acceptance of an alleged community of fate between human beings as the instance that should guide action, that's how Adorno defines uh, nationalism, basically, the acceptance of this uh, community of fate that should give, that should direct your actions. So in that conception, the idea of a society liberated from the compulsion of nature is already by implication denied that that is Adorno's main criticism of this of the optimism of the contemporary organizational forms of the labor movement uh, one of the texts uh, in in Adorno's writing where, where he 
perhaps most explicitly takes a position against nationalism and puts this quite central in, in this critique of the concept of the strange optimism of, of these organizations. Now, the second part, and that is quite typical of Adorno's writing, sort of switches the argument around or, or uh, tackles the, the, the issue from the other direction, if you like. There he argues that optimism once, he doesn't explain when once was, probably 19th century, perhaps uh, up to 1923 or thereabouts. So, so sort of in the sort of uh, period before the present period, in, in, in a sense, this, this, this is what once uh, must mean here. Optimism had a different meaning in that period. It expressed the sense that one could not afford to wait. It expressed urgency. The quotation is, at that time, optimism amounting to a disregard for death was an expression of the autonomous will. And the autonomous will in Adorno is the holy grail. That is the key characteristic or one key characteristic of, of the concept of emancipation because that is always the emancipation of the autonomous individual. Although that, that may be conceived as a social individual, but still an autonomous individual that is not subsumed to any kind of community. Only a shell is left in the present of this kind of uh, the, the kind of older form of optimism. The optimistic belief in the might of organization, which is the opposite of the autonomous will. So those who still express the autonomous will are suspected by the leaders of, or the, the managers of these organizations are suspected of defeatism and disloyalty. So the, the, the meaning of optimism entirely is, uh, is inverted by this. And then comes the the uh, phrase that I used already at the beginning, the optimism of the left repeats the insidious bourgeois superstition that one should not talk of the devil, but look on the bright side. So Adorno basically proposes here two contrary conceptions of what optimism of the left can mean. Uh, first one, which is heroic, that is transgressive of positive reality, positive here in the sense of posited, as in positivism, that is transcendental, emancipatory, and basically revolutionary. Although Adorno doesn't use exactly these words, but that is, uh, I think, very clearly the, the intention here. And then we have the opposite, the, the total inversion of that in the revisionist, reformist, conformist, positivist, nationalist, and authoritarian context of uh, positivism of the left in the present period. Now, what do I refer to in the title as Panglossian or rather anti-Panglossian? Panglossian or the, 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 the name of Pangloss uh, references the concept of optimism uh, in, in, in particular in a more philosophical 18th century uh, context. Pangloss is obviously a character in Voltaire's novel Candide, uh, Candide ou l'optimisme. So the title of the novel already contains uh, the, uh, the concept of optimism as its principal uh, theme. Now, this is a, uh, uh, it's, it's a very strange text. It's, it's actually very, very funny. It's, all, it's almost burlesque in a certain sense. It's probably one of Voltaire's best known texts, although I doubt that uh, he would have uh, thought of it as one of his main works. Even It reads to me much more like a, uh, something he was basically having a laugh with. So it's uh, it's 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 a comedy. It is it is uh, in 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 many ways very very cartoonish. It is actually uh, I had initially planned in the talk to uh, to compare this to, uh, to to the way humor is developed in Monty Python, for example, which of course also resonates with the uh, phrase that I used in the uh, title, as you're obviously aware of that song. Uh, and I think Voltaire has quite a lot in common uh, um, with that. Nevertheless, this is one of Voltaire's best known uh, texts. And it is, although it is uh, basically just um, a, a, a very funny uh, a satire and, and in, in a sense, it just plain silly in many ways. Uh, it still is a text that obviously illustrates or critiques a philosophical concept, namely that of optimism in a particular uh, 18th century sense, namely uh, the optimism that was represented uh, by the rationalist uh, philosophy of Leibniz. So obviously you all know uh, the, uh, the, the, the one phrase that everyone knows about Leibniz, which is that uh, everything is for the best in the best of all possible worlds, which 
actually to me I, I don't know much about Leibniz so it is not my uh, area of expertise at all but uh, in my understanding that is actually a much less scandalous sort of proposition than uh, then uh, it, it seems it is uh, assumed often because you have to uh, see this in the context of a, uh, of a basically a religious writer. So if you if you're a religious person and you believe in God and you believe that God to be not only almighty but also benign, then obviously uh, when he created the world, he would have created the best possible world. No, actually, best possible seems to me almost. A, a quite modest claim because the best possible is not the best it's just the best possible world that god could have created so to me that seems uh, to follow quite straightforwardly from christian theology so there, there's no uh, it's it's much less outrageous than than it sounds perhaps but anyway this is a uh, uh, one of the uh, sort of if, if you like a, a kind of a an, an epitome of, of, of extreme form of optimistic rationalism. On, on the right hand, we have a picture of uh, Pan Gloss. So Pan Gloss in the novel is the is the teacher or tutor of the protagonist Candide, and uh, Pan Gloss seems to be a caricature of of, of Leibniz. So at least this is how it was uh, understood um, in the period. Now, Pangloss's argument is probably quite different from what Leibniz actually argues, but uh, we're, we're not really, so I'm not really discussing Leibniz, I'm discussing Pangloss. So one of the uh, hilarious sequences uh, in, in Pangloss's uh, discourse in, in the novel is the following one, where he explains why syphilis is a good thing. Apparently, syphilis was a, a bit of, a, I don't know, if a pandemic or an epidemic, some sort of damage, uh, so kind of a, um, a horrendous uh, um, medical event in that period. Actually, I looked it up. It's not a virus. Uh, it is a bacterium, actually. But sort of similarly, it, it must have been a similarly important uh, event as uh, what we are sort of going through. So what Pangloss is arguing about syphilis is that it is indispensable in this best of worlds. It is a necessary ingredient for if Columbus when visiting the West Indies had not caught this disease, which poisons the source of generation, which is clearly opposed to the great end of nature, we should have neither chocolate nor cochineal. Obviously both chocolate and cochineal are unambiguously positive and uh, uh, welcome and benign things. So for, uh, for Pan Gloss, the existence of chocolate and cochineal sort of justifies the, uh, the existence of uh, syphilis, which is somehow uh, in his thinking causally related. Uh, to it. So what basically uh, uh, what he does, uh, what Pangloss argues is that an observed outcome, uh, any observed outcome in the present is a necessary outcome of a whole chain of, of causally related events in the past that all cannot be otherwise because they are all a part of a kind of systemic and uh, systemic grand plan. Uh, so that is Voltaire's lampooning of, um, of, of Leibniz's uh, rationalism. Uh, apparently for French uh, people in the 18th century, Leibniz was also a typically German professor. Uh, and, and this is probably also what the image here did, which is from, I think it's from a film version of the a film adaptation of the novel uh, is, is transporting. So the German professors were seen as sort of credulous and, and sentimental and a bit simplistic probably so that that is sort of the french take on, on the german wing of the rationalists in uh, enlightenment in, in that period now pan gloss i think and that is sort of my uh, my take on pan gloss pan gloss is funny because he's not religious so pan gloss is almost a positivist because what he does he argues backward he he, he starts with an empirically observed outcome such as chocolate uh, and then uh, sort of rationalizes backward into the uh, what he thinks is the causal chain that that uh, led uh, to, to this result whereas uh, uh, Leibniz is obviously a religious thinker. So if you put the theodicy, the, the conception of uh, that, um, that the, the, the creation is basically a, a, a good and that in the creation, in the goodness of the creation, you can sort of delineate the, the goodness of 
God, if you'd put that back in, it's not funny at all. Uh, it is completely serious philosophy, but because Voltaire takes out that aspect uh, and he basically plays it for laughs uh, in, in, in his novel, uh, it, it becomes funny. Now, what interests me here is not so much the, um, the, the relation to Leibniz, but rather the relation to Comte, uh, because to me, Comtean positivism seems rather Panglossian in, in that sense. And because critical theory is anti-positivist, it is also anti-Panglossian. So that is my train of, uh, my train of thought in, in this context. The connection is this, when rationalist philosophy claims it can rationally determine what are the causes of every phenomenon and why everything has to be as it is, then it's not a very big step from the, basically from the 18th to the 19th century that positivism will come along and describe the iron laws of nature, of human nature, of human society, etc., and then make predictions, make recipes, create blueprints, as Marx is formulating blueprints, uh, and, and, and that, that are recipes for the soup kitchens of the future. And, and obviously Marx is uh, in turn lampooning that. And also uh, to create modern states, parties that govern these states with their central committees, et cetera, et cetera. That is basically the Comtean positivist program. And it is an outcome of that form of basically Panglossian rationalism. Another uh, quite different outcome, or rather not an outcome, an instantiation uh, of, of that, um, of that uh, Panglossian uh, tendency uh, would be in political economy, which at least in the initial stages is quite different from, from positivism. So if you think of Mondeville's uh, fable of the bees from the very beginning of the 18th century, as sort of the, 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 the mythical or um, myth formed starting point of, of political economy, that is very Panglossian, very, uh, um, in, in his, it's obviously in Montville, it is also a satire. And I think that that's, that is not entirely uh, coincidental. Uh, Montville's poem is also absolutely hilarious, very, very funny. And it's not entirely clear uh, if you think about the intention of the author Montville, what exactly he was actually meaning to satirize, but he is satirizing something. Uh, and whatever it is, he's uh, sort of getting at it is uh, uh, riotously funny. So his idea is that the, the beehive, which is obviously an image of London in, in that context, which is the capital of commercial society, that every everybody in London is basically a criminal. But that's okay because the sum total of all these criminals and crooks, uh, they, they create wealth and happiness. So that, that, is, uh, that is how Maudville uh, describes this particular strange beehive which is London. Every part was full of vice, but the whole thing was a paradise. You have fraud, luxury, and pride, which are basically all cardinal sins, whilst we the benefits receive. Benefits not as in unemployment benefits. He, he means the, the, the goodness and the paradisiac character of the new type of society, which is basically the, the kind of takeoff stage of our society. So in that sense, also political economy is pan glossing because all bad things greed and all that are really good things because they create wealth and harmony. So we have a certain pattern here. We have syphilis is good because it is, it is a part of the causal chain that gives us chocolate. Egoism and greed are good because they create wealth and harmony. And then the more interesting uh, question, and this is what I'm actually uh, coming to now, which is sort of really the question, what does that um, what does that mean for our own discourses? How does that actually work? Or are there traces or are there elements of that in Marxist or Marxian theory and in critical theory? So the question is there, or the question becomes there in sort of in analogy, if you like, whether capitalism is a part of a causal chain that leads or will lead or might lead to emancipation or communism, which is sort of uh, almost in my mind an interchangeable uh, concept, universal emancipation. And likewise, anti-capitalism, which of course 
depends on capitalism. You cannot have anti-capitalism without capitalism, right? Um, does anti-capitalism necessarily lead to emancipation or communism? These are two actually separate questions, although they are uh, closely interlinked. And this is what I'm uh, sort of trying to uh, discuss in the uh, remainder of the talk. So how Panglossian is that? And is that necessarily a bad thing? Now, the concept of Panglossian optimism, uh, I would characterize or summarize in, 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 in with these characteristics. It is a sort of system thinking, very much like in system theory. So if you take Tagore Parsons, totally super Panglossian. It is based on an exaggerated or, if you like, a one-sided form of rationalism, and in that sense, completely different from Kantian idealism. So from the uh, later um, installment of enlightenment thinking, which obviously differs from, from rationalism by synthesizing rationalism with, with empiricism, with, with creating a completely different conception, which is in the background uh, of, uh, of, of Hegel and Marx, obviously. So you have here sort of what you might perhaps want to call a kind of a fetishism of causality, which is what Voltaire uh, satirizes in the figure of Pangloss, and also an exaggerated trust in the knowability of that causality. So Pangloss is kind of constantly, he is a theory for everything. He's one of these extremely annoying people who can explain everything because they believe not only that there's a reason for everything, but also that they know this reason and they, they have a theory for all that chocolate. So he can, he can, ex he can explain it exactly how it is. Of course, uh, we all know uh, extremely annoying people like that. Uh, that would be part of this kind of exaggerated form of rationalism. It has a teleology built into it because it leads somewhere chocolate uh, in, in that case. Uh, it has an assumption of, of the world being of a benign nature, which obviously is, a, is an inheritance from theology because the creation is benign. And also the, the idea that the best of all possible worlds can be improved, but only gradually within the causality change, uh, chains uh, of what is its systemic character. So that is sort of the, 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 the phantom, image, phantom image of Panglossianism. Now, all this, I think, cannot be just brushed aside. So I think Pangloss probably has a point in many ways, but um, there's also the opposite perspective, and perhaps more importantly, and certainly to, uh, to critical theory, the, the most visible phase is actually a rejection of, of all that. And the most famous, the, the kind of the, um, the how, how do you say, the, the, the emblematic expression of that is obviously uh, in Walter Benjamin's uh, On the Concept of History, uh, the piece 11, uh, where he says, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, you all know this, nothing has so corrupted the German working class as the opinion that it, was moving with the current. It regarded technological development as the gradient of the stream with which it thought it was moving. From there, it was but a step to the illusion that the factory work that ostensibly came in the train of technological progress constituted a political accomplishment. This is obviously Walter Benjamin's uh, sort of um, summary uh, assessment of the process that lead of, that, are, that obviously leads to the threefold defeat of the labor movement in the first half of the 20th century and then fascism, World War II, uh, Holocaust, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and uh, of course, his own suicide in that context. Now that is probably fairly obvious and probably fairly well known. Uh, but there are also other aspects. There are other elements in critical theory that seem much less straightforwardly anti-Panglossian. And I would like to throw out some of these. Uh, the, the first one is probably the most difficult and the, and, the, and the strangest. This is a sequence from the last paragraph of the first chapter of Dialectic of Enlightenment, which is called the Concept of Enlightenment. That is the chapter in which Horkheimer and Adorno lay out the basic argument of Dialectic of Enlightenment. And this is the last paragraph. So this is kind of in 
the place where they sort of summarize what this is really about. Obviously, you know, the, the subsequent chapters are all basically um, additional material that, that highlight particular aspects of the argument that is contained in the first chapter. And here in this absolutely key sequence in what is probably the key text in, in Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, they, they make the following very strange uh, statement. In multiplying Gewalt, which can obviously mean violence, power, force, domination, through the mediation of the market, the bourgeois economy has multiplied also its things and forces to such an extent that the administration no longer requires kings, nor even the bourgeois themselves. And now comes the killer sentence, kind of very lapidary. It only needs all, <laughs> which is almost, almost funny in its own sort of drama. Uh, because to say that uh, modern society requires to its administration only the involvement of all in the administration of society. That is obviously a, or I, I read that as a, a barely disguised definition of communism. So that, that, is, that is what communism is, right? The administration of society by all. Um, and, and they say, that's all it needs. <laughs> obviously, that is the most difficult thing uh, in, in, in any uh, conceivable uh, conception of history. But, but this is the way they put it here. So we don't need kings anymore. We don't even need the bourgeoisie to run affairs. We only need all. <laughs> and they all learn from the power of things finally to forego domination, which sounds more mysterious in German because power and domination are the same word in German. In English, it sounds slightly more analytical because we have two different words for that. So we learn from the power of things. So there's, uh, so, so we basically, modern society have created all these things, things as in social things uh, that includes institutions, knowledge, science, technology, machinery, all, all these things, they have power. And we learn from that power that we actually don't need power or we don't need domination. We don't need to subject each other because that's because we created all this, these things. <laughs> and we know from, because we created them, we are, can basically master them if all are involved in that process. That is, that is uh, basically what they designate as the key message of dialectic of enlightenment, which is, uh, which is quite, yeah, quite a uh, quite a quite a statement there, and it's uh, especially if you think, considering the, the reputation of the dialectic of enlightenment as this terribly dark and pessimistic document, surprisingly optimistic, right? It's almost Panglossian. That that's sort of what I'm uh, trying to get at here. So there's there's an element of sort of a very strange optimism in this in this very darkest of texts. That's my first uh, example. Going back to Marx from there, uh, another sort of Panglossian uh, uh, feature in Marx is the, is the often quoted uh, image of the old mole that, that Marx uses uh, repeatedly. I think there are at least four or five different uh, iterations of that, but the, the, the clearest or most developed is perhaps uh, the one in chapter seven of the 18th Brumaire. Uh, the, the formulation is actually taken from Shakespeare. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's in Hamlet uh, and was taken by, um, uh, by, by Hegel. Uh, so Hegel takes this uh, Shakespeare quote and, and Marx then uses the, the adapted Shakespeare quote uh, for, for his own purposes, uh, whereby uh, the, the character of the mole somewhat changes. So in Hamlet, the mole is the ghost uh, of, of, of Hamlet's father, who is literally, obviously, he's a mole because he's underneath the, uh, the, 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 the scene, the, how do you say, the stage, he's in, in the wooden structure of the stage. So that's, that's why he calls him a mole. So in the father, the, obviously this is uh, psychological uh, stuff. So he has these uh, apparitions and, and guilt feelings and, and all the rest of it. So Hegel uses that image. Uh, in, in Hegel, it becomes obviously, uh, the, the ghost becomes the spirit, the, the world spirit. And in Marx, then obviously the world spirit becomes the spirit of revolution, right? So the funny thing is that in the, uh, in the 18th Brumaire, at, at this uh, 
in this text where he uses this image, he's basically saying that the Bonapartist counter-revolution, a modernizing counter-revolution, will in the future reveal itself to have been a mere stepping stone on the overarching methodical and dialectical trajectory of revolution. So we will one day understand that the Bonapartist counter-revolution was a step in the evolution of revolution, <laughs> which is, a, if you think about it, a very strange and almost Comtean sort of um, bit, which nevertheless is one of the, probably one of the most quoted images uh, uh, from Marx, but it is very, very strange. So is there really a redeeming feature to Bonapartist counter-revolution? Is this really what Marx is trying to say here? So it sounds like it is what he's trying to say there. So it, 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 it owes something uh, to the, if you like, historical sociology of, of Guizot or Comte, who, who make the argument in the, in the beginning of the 19th century that the French Revolution, the event, the French Revolution, is merely a symptom of the overall process of societal revolution, rising bourgeoisie and all that, uh, which in, in Comte and also in Guizot is a process that takes some 800 years, basically, since the late Middle Ages. And the revolution itself is just sort of the, 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 the final installment of that. In, in a certain sense, any historical sociology and, and the historical sociology derives from that idea. So that is the key, that is the big idea, um, how we look at history from a sort of uh, if you like, a societal perspective. It is in that sense, almost inevitably, somewhat positivist or structural in a certain sense. Uh, which brings us to the Communist Manifesto, which is probably the, the most Panglossian <laughs> text in the, in the Marxian uh, canon, if, if you like. As, as, you, as you know, in the first section, Marx sets out with relish why the ruling classes of Europe had to fear capitalist modernity that increasingly, whether they liked it or not, was becoming the material basis of modern domination and exploitation, in which they could only adopt or be swept away by. Capitalism destroyed all ideas of natural superiority or hierarchy or case society and all, all that kind of stuff, all sentimental illusions and prejudices, including religion, family, patrimonialism, parochialism, nationality, unfortunately not true. In many ways, capitalist modernity, we now know, actually created or perhaps recreated such essentialisms, but at the same time also undermined them. Um, obviously, Baliba and Wallerstein are, are very good on that strange dialectic, what capitalist modernity does to these essentialisms, if you like. But Marx is here, uh, obviously, um, quite sanguine ab about the, the perspective. Communism is not a specter or conspiracy, but quite straightforwardly the product, the, the product of the dialectical dynamics of the capitalist mode of production itself. So that, that is sort of how he makes fun of the, uh, the, the, uh, the paranoia of the, of the bourgeoisie, uh, that there is this big conspiracy and the specter of communism and all this. No, no specter. It's just the dynamics of your own creation at work. That, that's what he's saying uh, in the first section of the manifesto. The communists only need to abolish institutions that are in their bourgeois form already chimerical property, nationality, the family, etc. They are all specters that they hardly exist. Again, uh, somewhat over optimistic, but that, that is Marx's thrust here in this, in this text. The communist movement depends on capitalist modernity. The labor movement, in fact, helped bring about, we now know, sort of looking back, or we understand looking back, had bring about many of the forms and institutions of modern capitalist society, which the bourgeoisie very often wasn't bothered doing. We did that in a certain sense. Radical anti-Semites sensed that in the, in, the, in the last third of the 19th century, sensed this strange coalition and equated the red and the golden internationals in the chimerical figure of the Jew. So this is sort of the, the essence of modern late 19th century antisemitism, that the antisemites sort of, they, they sense something there, that there is this mutual dependency uh, 
of the labor movement and capitalism. And this is, ah, okay, the capitalists, they are Jews. Obviously, they know that because that is, uh, that is just an inherited ideological figure. And the leaders of the labor movement, this Marx guy in, in particular, oh, yeah, they're also Jews. So they're, they're the same thing. That is for them. Uh, indeed a super panglossian but for them an entirely logical conclusion to draw and they come up with this conspiracy that capitalism and communism are the same thing uh, a, a conspiracy of jews basically <laughs> that is obviously they are the kind of super panglossians in that sense now for something completely different a line of poetry from Goethe that you're probably all familiar with, although you might not be familiar with Goethe necessarily, but you, uh, you know this from a, a particular <laughs> um, application, uh, from, from a poem called To the Laika, uh, from his collection of, of um, uh, lyrical poetry, the West Eastern Divan. Uh, the, this this uh, stanza is this one. Uh, Should this torture then tremendous, since it brings us greater pleasure, were not through the rule of Timur, souls devoured without measure. Now, this poem is actually a poem about roses. Uh, it's a poem about how many roses have to die to make a small bottle of perfume. Only the last stanza of this poem is not about roses, but it mentions uh, Timur, um, which is very, very strange. So the, the, the whole poem is kind of weird. But this is the, uh, from the late work of Goethe, and, and the late work of great geniuses is, is often rather weird. And, and this, is, this, is, this is seriously weird. But uh, the, the structure of the poem is basically, uh, as in this equation here, that roses relate to perfume, which is a good thing, uh, like the necessary slaughter uh, that occurred in the uh, military campaigns of Timur uh, relates to Timur's empire. Now, I suspect that for Goethe, probably uh, the establishment of Timur's empire was a positive thing because uh, Timur was on the one hand, obviously, which probably we know him primarily as an as an emulator of Genghis Khan, a, a incredibly uh, a brutal military leader. But at the same time, he, he must have been an incredibly uh, clever politician and a great patron of the arts. So apparently he was friends with Ibn Khaldun, which was one of the great intellectuals of that period, one of the forefathers of uh, social science in in a sense a bit like uh, Car uh, Ibn Khaldun is a bit like Montesquieu but three four hundred years earlier incredibly interesting so Timo was hanging out with these guy, kind of guys and that is what empire building certainly for uh, someone like Goethe obviously means so it is incredibly brutal but on the other hand uh, like the dead roses um, result in a small bottle of perfume there are some upsides to that. <laughs> and that is obviously very much an 18th and, and early 19th century sort of perspective. So I, I've read somewhere that uh, Timur's campaigns killed something like 5% of the world population at the time. So it, it must have been uh, exceptionally uh, uh, brutal by, by any kind of standards. Now, um, Marx quotes this stanza or uh, uses it, doesn't necessarily always quote the whole thing, uh, at, at least four times. The, this is discussed in Kevin Anderson's book, uh, Marx at the Martians. Uh, one of these you, is the one you all know, that is an, uh, an article on India that is made famous by, by, uh, by Edward Said, obviously. Uh, there are two occurrences where Marx uses these uh, this stanza uh, clearly in a sort of sarcastic way because they, it is uh, he, he gives the lines to capitalists uh, to speak. So there's clearly they it is clearly just uh, illustrating the, the the moral depravity of these capitalists. And then there's the text on India where uh, it expresses something slightly ambiguous. And there's another uh, uh, text also quoted by Kevin Anderson. That's why I'm taking this from. Uh, where the kind of ambiguity and, and what I propose to call the sort of Panglossian uh, element of this uh, becomes a, a very clear, similar to the text on India, but more straightforward because it's not about India. So it's less 
complicated in a sense to interpret. He's talking about uh, 15 men are being killed every week in the English coal mines on an average, mostly by the sordid avarice of the owners of the coal mines. This is generally to be remarked. This is from Marx's um, manuscripts, um, sort of note taking from, from the beginning of the 60s in the process of writing Capital. Uh, the capitalistic production is most economical of realized labor, re labor realized in commodities, basically value, but it is a huge spent thrift, more than any other mode of production, of man, of living labor, spent thrift, not only of flesh and blood and muscles, but of brains and nerves. It is, in fact, only at the greatest waste of individual development that the development of general man is secured in those epochs of history which prelude to a socialist constitution of mankind. And then he quotes these lines from Goethe, should this torture capitalism, then torment us since it brings us greater pleasure, socialism. We're not through the rule of Timur, souls devoured without measure. So also the establishment of Timur's magnificent empire was based on that much killing. And this, uh, well, maybe surprising. I, I, I find this, hmm, um, a strange aspect. So basically we have here um, a sort of, um, uh, the, the question arises here, what is actually for us, or for Marx in theory, the connection between capitalism and, and, and emancipation, and then the connection between anti-capitalism and emancipation. So there are two different, but of course, closely related problems. I'm not turning to some uh, uh, illustrations of the second type, the question of the relationship between anti-capitalism and emancipation. And I would like to start with an example from the, uh, from the context I already uh, hinted at, the end of the last decade of the 19th century. Uh, Germany, the, uh, the context of the Social Democratic Panglossian Party of Germany, SPD. 1890s Imperial Germany saw the rise and also the fall of the first modern anti-Semitic political parties. That was a huge problem for all other political groups and parties, how to relate to these guys. So in a sense, they were uh, perhaps the most modern phenomenon uh, in that context because they were actually kind of grass, they were doing some proper grassroots organizing with some seriously disgruntled people and training them to be anti-Semites. Now, some liberals and some socialists shared the notion that anti-Semitic anti-capitalism would by necessity prepare the ground for and perhaps turn into proletarian anti-capitalism, which the liberals obviously feared and the socialists obviously hoped for. So the socialists thought, and that that was a a fairly widespread attitude in that particular period among social democrats that hmm, we shouldn't be too negative on these guys because maybe we can recruit them because they're sort of the thinking there was among some social democrats uh, by, by any means not all but uh, some leading figures in the social democratic party they speculated that these anti-semites who had access to the peasantry and to small town people in ways that they didn't, they would indirectly further socialist consciousness among the non-working class poor, which they couldn't reach, by proving itself to be an inadequate, namely a petty bourgeois criticism of capitalist society. So it is sort of an incomplete anti-capitalism, and they thought it must lead to proper anti-capitalism. And obviously, we know that that strategy didn't turn out that well. My take on this is, which I developed in, 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 in this article, I allow myself to throw in some references to uh, uh, what, what I'm kind of hinting at here. I'm, I'm running through some arguments rather quickly, obviously, as, as, as you do in a presentation. My take on, on this process is that reactionary critiques of capitalism reject what I like to call the corrosive and potentially emancipatory aspects of capitalist modernity. So my, my proposition here is that the things that are positive about capitalism is its negativity, basically. So, and, and that is what I think Marx is actually getting at in the first section of the manifesto. That is, that is what he's saying. So the good thing about capitalism is that it destroys so much, or at least tries to destroy so much, uh, that it corrodes all that is 
solid and, and kind of destroys these things, throws them up in the air, which opens the perspective, the possibility uh, for an opening in history uh, out of which a new form of modern society uh, might emerge, which is what we would probably refer to as communism. So the specificity of Marx in this context is that he is not straightforwardly an anti-liberal like La Salle and others were, like most others, others were, but he is rather what you could perhaps call a through and beyond liberal. So somebody who basically um, tries to take the liberal idea of progress and kind of go into so much overdrive with it that it turns into communism. That I, I think that is um, that is sort of how the what is basically in a, a case of historical irony, a kind of Hegelian irony, how, how that works uh, in Marx. And I think that is quite central. There's a formulation in an essay by Chattopati that I like uh, very much, uh, that I think manages to avoid the Panglossian character uh, of this pattern of thought, or maybe you could say, uh, Chattopati here gives us a non-Panglossian version of this sort of this argument. He says Marx shows how capital creates the subjective and objective conditions of its own negation and simultaneously the elements of the new society destined to supersede it, which he calls socialism. So the important thing here is for me the use of the words conditions and elements. So capital does not create its own cre creation it creates the conditions of its own negation. So still somebody has to do the negating, so it doesn't just happen. And also it doesn't create the new society that doesn't somehow emerge from it as chocolate does from syphilis, uh, but the elements are provided. Uh, but somebody still has to put together these elements in, in the right way. Uh, and, and that's obviously the tricky part. So capitalism creates perhaps the opening, but what actually happens in the opening, which is just another word for revolution, that is, that is an entirely different question. Now the problem in, or one of the problems in, in this context uh, is that being against capitalism can mean very different things. And, and this is uh, where the issue of the, the link between anti-capitalism and emancipation becomes problematic. Conservative revolution, for example, this is one of the major uh, reactionary intellectual movements in the immediate period after World War One, so uh, 1920s chiefly. So the kind of the the the, uh, the, the if you like the, the the starting point or the not starting point the how could you say so the the, um, the, the, the blueprint if you like of any kind of ultra right wing uh, form of politics in the 20th century and in the present finds capitalism is bad because it makes women and gays rebellious. It upsets the order and they're, they're constantly talking about sex and gender. So this is this totally, they're totally obsessed with that. This is really central to their uh, perspective and to their anti-capitalism because anti-capitalism empowers women basically and even worse gays. It upsets the order where everybody knows their place. Traditionally on the left, that was sometimes, well, maybe I'm being too polite here, seen as a minor issue. The left sometimes entered coalitions for the better of the main cause, abolish capitalism, and then sought out the details later, uh, which usually ends badly. And this also exists in the present. So if, if you take, if you look for contemporary forms of a conservative revolution or political movements that are derived from the philosophy of the conservative revolution. Uh, one example would be Islamism, which uh, at least until recently uh, was uh, very commonly on the sort of soft left or some aspect or some areas of the organized left seen as a uh, pretty good, um, pretty good coalition partner and the small differences about homosexuals and so on, we can sort that out later, which uh, obviously in the, uh, in the Iranian revolution didn't go so well. Um, uh, so, so this is very much a contemporary problem, but inherited from the late 19th century. Now, <laughs> critical theory, the perspective that pivots towards a discussion or a critique of civilization, 
of which I would argue patriarchy is a key descriptor, a part of its deep structure, does not allow this sort of cavalry attitude towards sort of doing common business uh, with reactionary forms of anti-capitalism. Critical theory allows us to accept and actually emphasizes that capitalist modernity has brought some positive changes to human civilization. So the idea here is, and that is central to dialectic of enlightenment, what they do in that book is they kind of interlink a critique of capitalist modernity, which is the critique of the present, that's where we are living, with a critique of civilization. And what brings them to that move uh, is the reflection on, on principally uh, uh, the Holocaust, because that is something that cannot be explained only out of the analysis of present society. That is a sort of almost anthropological sort of dimension in there uh, that needs the, the critique of civilization as a whole. Now, the critique of capitalism as the current stage of human civilization, which is sort of, a, what is it, seven, 8,000 year um, chunk of, of, of history that we need to critique. Uh, the, the perspective with which we critique the present must be situated in the critique of human civilization as a whole. And that is what in, in critical theory gives the critique of capitalism its direction. Uh, so, so in a sense, if you look for a criterion uh, with which to determine what is actually good and what is definitely bad about capitalism, then the critique of civilization basically provides you with that perspective, with that criterion. That, that is the idea here. Now I, um, I've, I've made a little chart here, um, uh, sort of illustrating, I, I, I thought we have maybe a lot of economists uh, in, in the audience, so I tried to be a little bit scientific um, in this particular uh, aspect. Uh, th this chart's sort of meant to illustrate a kind of um, typology of behaviors and um, sort of also uh, strategies of social movements. You, so you see in, in, the, in the horizontal axis communism and capitalism on the vertical axis here, and you have kind of the, 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 the plus, uh, neutral, and, and minus, uh, meaning uh, behaviors or actions that are good in the preparation or in the building up of the potential for a future communist society, neutral or negative for that. And then you have in the, in the, in the kind of in the vertical rows here, you have actions that are either good for capitalism, that are neutral concerning capitalism and actions that are bad for capitalism. Now you have a big marker, the, the big X at the, in the bottom left, corner of, of, of the chart, uh, the most desirable form of social movement action would be uh, things that are bad for capitalism and good in the perspective of communism. So actions that are basically delivering on both tasks, task one and capitalism, task two, make communism. So we have here behaviors or policies or movements that would do both of these things. Then we have perhaps other types of behavior that are effective, positive in the perspective of, of making communism, but sort of neutral about capitalism. Uh, I, I've, I can think about quite a lot of things that are basically uh, contributing to our developing the capacity to one day uh, create this emancipatory uh, society, but that are actually neither here nor there uh, in the perspective of getting rid of capitalism. And then a slightly smaller mark we have uh, for things that are good for communism, but maybe also good for capitalism. That, that is at least theoretically conceivable. And also we have things that, uh, that are sort of thumbs up still, although in a, in a minor way, for things that are bad for capitalism and sort of neutral for communism. But we should definitely not engage in any kind of activity that is bad for the future development of communism, whether or not it is also bad for capitalism. So this is a kind of um, fairly abstract sort of proposition that, that I've developed in this paper. I just mentioned this because I like the title of this paper. It's one of, one of my favorites actually. So I thought I allow myself to mention this here. So back to uh, dialectic of enlightenment. Uh, in, again, from the same last paragraph of the concept of enlightenment, 
the first chapter of Dialectic of Enlightenment that I quoted from already, uh, they say the following, socialism in a concession to reactionary common sense prematurely confirmed as eternal that necessity, namely the necessity of the societal domination that results from the struggle for self-preservation against overwhelming hostile nature. So in this passage, and again, I, I emphasize this is the key passage in Dialectic of Enlightenment. What they do is they formulate a critique of the labor movement. And they criticize the labor movement for having conceded too much to reactionary common sense. And that reactionary common sense basically is that there needs to be economy. There needs to be a, a hierarchical organization of society in the service of uh, self-preservation of, of humanity, which is an as aspect of civilization. So civilization is basically about that, about the, 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 uh, um, the, the kind of um, the, the structured organizing of human self-preservation, while at the same time working towards overcoming the necessity of working towards self-preservation by inventing things that make self-preservation easier, like the way we produce our necessities, etc. The domination of nature, though, reflects and extends nature itself, whose essence is nothing other than necessity and the struggle for self-preservation, thereby trapping humanity in prehistory. That's basically their main point. A too obsessive fixation on the, the basic trajectory of human civilization in the name of self-preservation actually traps us there, and we, we are prevented from leaving that behind. And, and kind of leaping out of that, um, what Marx would call the prehistory of communism or the prehistory of truly humane history. The progress towards history proper, the history of humane society reconciled with nature, that, that's the future perspective, is thereby arrested. And uh, this is basically the accusation they make in the direction of the labor movement. So basically saying that they're by far not radical enough. That is the principal proposition of dialectic of enlightenment. Now I come sort of to the concluding uh, slides you will be pleased to hear. The question is, and that is in my understanding, the key question of critical theory uh, to which I, uh, um, in, 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 in which I include uh, Marx, uh, how can civilization be reformed so as to loosen its link to self-preservation and to produce human beings beyond what Horkheimer calls the anthropology of the bourgeois epoch. So Horkheimer has this idea that the bourgeois epoch, so the last four or 500 years basically, has produced a specific type of human being that is cold, calculating, um, exploitative, hierarchical, obsessed with dom domineering and, and, and so on. How we can how can we go beyond that anthropological type of human being? That is, that is the principal question. In critical theory, the proposition is that the fight against capitalism ought to take the form of the practical self-critique of civilization. Enlightenment fights in capitalism its own corrupted form of appearance. By form of appearance, I mean the form in which it actually appears. I don't mean appearance as in illusion. I mean appearance as in manifestation. So capitalism is the current manifestation of human civilization, the current, if you like, stage, although I don't like the word stage for obvious reasons, but the current form in which human civilization presents itself. And the fight against capitalism is civilization's own self-reflective fight against its own current form of manifestation. That is the principal proposition. And it's only in this sense that the proletariat can redeem humanity. And, and I think that is what Marx means uh, because and no, no other meaning to me makes any sense. So the, uh, if, if the proletariat, which is just another name for the self-negation of capitalist society because the proletariat is the class that does not want to be a class, that, that is the principal definition. So uh, it is the class of self-negation par excellence. 
the only sense in which it would be able to redeem humanity is that it sort of cashes in the promises of civilization, which are currently not served very well by human civilization in its capitalist form. So I, I think the, the idea there is, and that is a little bit Panglossian, that is sort of a bit of Hegelian irony in here, that things are so bad in capitalism that it's almost good. So the, 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 the extreme badness of, of the capitalist manifestation of, of human uh, civilization, it is so extreme that it actually opens the prospect of finally leaping out of that trap, this uh, obsessive kind of preoccupation with organizing self-preservation. So we can finally go beyond that because we have created the forces and things, if you remember from the earlier quote uh, from Dialectic of Enlightenment, we have created the forces and things that allow us to, to, to relax, to lean back a bit and create civilization in the perspective of not fighting so hard for self-preservation because self-preservation actually isn't that difficult anymore uh, because we have all these forces and things. So that, that is sort of in a nutshell what I think dialectic of enlightenment is about. The book, mostly between the lines, responds to reactionary critiques of liberal bourgeois society by anti-Semites, fascists, Nazis, and other uh, reactionaries, because the longing for a humane future must be based on a critique of civilization beyond a critique of capitalism only, that needs explicitly to be developed in opposition to reactionary and conservative critiques of civilization of which anti-Semitism very often is a signifier. Anti-Semitism is able to filter into a whole variety of contexts as a reactionary resentment of capitalist modernity, by which I mean the structure and dynamics of modern society and economy, as well as the political and cultural formations that tend to accompany it. So both of these things I mean by capitalist modernity. Now the puzzling thing is, and, and this is very much, uh, 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 unfortunately, <laughs> very much a, a contemporary, a pressing contemporary, maybe the pressing contemporary problem. Why and when is the pseudo critique more attractive than the emancipatory critique? Why? Why do people go for the fake critique when they could easily have the real thing? What are the specific contents and contexts that make some forms of critique of capitalism vulnerable to being articulated in anti-Semitic, racist, sexist, homophobic forms? Which aspects of modern capitalist society are to be denounced and which are to be welcomed, as in the Communist Manifesto, follows from the kind of critique of civilization that gives direction to the critique of capitalist modernity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marcel. It was, it was very exciting, a very exciting presentation. <laughs> Thank <Yes>. you. <laughs> and can you please can you please show again your your favorite article, the topic of your favorite article? Oh, with pleasure. Um... <laughs> what was it? Yes. One. Yes. Okay. I <laughs> I take a photo. I read it. <laughs> okay. It's a very funny article. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> so we are we have now audience discussion. So if if you have any questions, please uh, leave a message in the chatting room so that I can see and uh, we can uh, have. Uh, Should I stop sharing now or? Oh, that might be better. Yes. Yeah. So we can. Uh... Yeah. see the chat box okay oh 17 people quite a lot yeah <laughs> great um, did master can master uh uh can i have can i uh ask you one question how can you defend the the, how 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 did you defend 
I don't remember. How did you defend the, the Panglossian, super, super Panglossian view of Marx in the Communist Manifesto and uh, his writing in, in, about India? Yes. Is how how can you defend Marx's uh, super Panglossian, or how how uh, or did you criticize it? Yeah, I'm I myself ambiguous about that. Uh, similar to 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 Kevin Anderson. So uh, I mean, Kevin Anderson basic basically transolves the problem into one of chronology, but he's basically saying. Is sort of Marx is Eurocentric first and then gradually embraces or expresses more sympathy for um, basically in, um, the, the, the position of uh, what, what is if in effect the, the, the Indian resistance to, to colonialism and so on. I'm, I'm not totally convinced by the chronology aspect of it I, I suspect that it is more like a a dialectic or a contradiction depending on how you want to evaluate it in Marx's thinking so I, I think it is that he's always sort of on the fence on this because and and so are uh, many uh, historians and, and commentators uh, in in that case uh, in in India so obviously the the um, the panglossian take would be to say well uh, the um, the modernity as it did actually happen uh, at least destroyed uh, a, a rather unsavory and and uh, oppressive uh, social structure obviously it brought in another unsavory and oppressive structure but uh, if Marx is right, then the unsavory oppressive structure that we've got now at least has the benefit that it provides, as um, Pato Chadiai formulates it, the, the elements and the, the uh, what was it, elements and the, the possibilities, the potential for overcoming this one which is so bad that it's overcoming might actually usher in finally something that is truly better that, that that's that's the idea and that that is central to marx so i think there's no way to get out of that contradiction and it will always be um, an, an issue of contention so there's no there's no solution to that i think so I, i'm i'm not i'm not aware of one and I don't think there can be one. It, it is uh, obviously, I, I think it is very, very important to say that the, um, the sort of, I mean, the, 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 the way of Marx uses this stanza from Goethe is probably uh, rather unhelpful because uh, th this has an element of sarcasm to it that is. Um, almost sort of rude or what, what is not rude is not the right word it is sort of uh, hugely insensitive probably or it is misleading perhaps or it is yeah it is it is unhelpful in, in a way because uh, and it's also most bizarre I mean even Goethe's poem itself is most bizarre and, and the, the use Marx makes of this particular stanza is very bizarre but uh, I mean, there are many formulations in Marx that are bizarre and strange. So the, uh, you, you can have a whole catalog of very uh, unsavory formulations concerning Jews and concerning all kinds of, um, as it were, racial categories of people that, that, that he makes fun of and uses in various ways. So, so Marx's language is uh, often unhelpful in, in, in many of these things. And that is that is simply a fact of the text that uh, as a sort of um, as every uh, <laughs> group of um, interpreters of a particular body of text, we have to live with the inconsistencies and the, the rough character of that text and we have to try and make sense of it and and see the, the, the contradiction in there. So uh, obviously what I was meaning to say um, 
two minutes ago but, uh, when I started. Uh, what, what is important to keep in mind is that um, obviously British imperialism in no way depended on Marx's approval. So what, whether Marx, what Marx thinks of British imperialism is completely irrelevant. So he, he was a completely isolated figure as, as, as are we. So what we think is pretty irrelevant. I mean, who, who cares really? Uh, who cared what Marx thinks about these, these kind of matters? Maybe in his journalistic writings that, that had some kind of relevance, but uh, it, it is not uh, that, uh, so, so what, what Marx does here is he's an intellectual who thinks through theoretical possibilities in particular historical matters and, and formulated them sometimes in unhelpful manners, but the, uh, this does not in any way mean that he supported, so, so, so Marx never at any point even remotely uh, supported British imperialism. What he did was saying, uh, at the together with all the destruction these these guys are causing, in, in, uh, um, they also create something that might actually turn out to be useful. So that is that is very different from saying, "Oh yeah, go on, <laughs> um, beat them hard." So that that is obviously not what what Marx says, and uh, and Kevin Anderson also clearly emphasizes that whenever any kind of rebellion breaks out anywhere, uh, Marx is absolutely enthusiastic about it. And that, that obviously uh, includes uh, very famously the Sepoy rebellion and, and, and so on. So any, anyone anywhere re rebelling uh, always has Marx's enthusiasm. But there, there the, the, the kind of the um, sort of nuances come in his sort of in theoretical interpretation of what these struggles mean in his trajectory and his trajectory is um, the, the, the revolution to make communism must come from the working class for there to be a working class there must be capitalism simple so if there's no capitalism no working class no communism so that that was his perspective uh, except perhaps occasionally he has second thoughts even on that, but for most of his life, quite clearly that is his perspective. And, um, we can have a number of different opinions on the degree to which we would agree with that perspective So and, and, and what that actually means. So um, I, I, I kind of hinted that I understand the term proletariat as one that basically means it's, it's basically a stand in for self negation. So it is a very different thing from. So proletariat is a very different thing from working class. Uh, working class is a much more, or I, I take to be working class a much more sociological, empirical concept, if you like. And proletariat, which was an odd word to use also in Marx's time, to me seems much more philosophically loaded. Um. Okay, and, and uh, we have uh, Song Jin uh, question. Yeah, Song Jin has uh, two questions. The master, can you can you see that his? Yeah, I just need to chat? go up. Should I read it out? I think. No, or or Song Jin, would you please? Uh, read it out. Your... Ah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, fascinating presentation. Your talk is uh, very helpful for our SSK research on post capitalism by making us rethink the meaning of the common sense victim, pessimism of the internet, and the optimism of the real. And I also, uh, in your presentation, mapping good or bad for capitalism and good or bad for communism is remarkable and very interesting. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first question actually is already uh, someone raised and you, uh, I think, yeah, I now understand your question, but uh, I would like to, yes, but, but our focus is a little different. So I, my question, the first 
is uh, uh, you plus him to admit any weakness in Marx's thought on the uh, non-European societies in Communist Manifesto or articles on India, uh, which, uh, uh, which you, you quote, uh, quote as uh, Pimo. However, I think late Marx, uh, especially in his uh, uh, so, uh, manuscript or letters, uh, communication with Vera uh, Daslich, is uh, substantially discounted his earlier source of so-called capitalist modernity. Uh, so as you uh, just uh, explained, is uh, Kevin Anderson, is, uh, I think very is, uh, persuasive, persuasively is, uh, demonstrated. Uh, late Marx became increasingly, I think, pessimistic of capitalist modernity. So what do you think? And my second question, you seem, I, I think it's uh, more like it's, uh, it's related to your writings uh, on imperialism. So uh, although you uh, did not present in full uh, this evening's talk, you seem to equate this uh, anti-Semitism with nationalism and do not admit any progressiveness in nationalism in general. However, as for the uh, anti-imperialist struggles of the people in oppressed nations or colonies, I think uh, it's uh, left or perceived need to suffer them. So, so what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so on, on the first question, I've, I've said something already. So I, um, it's been a while that I read Kevin Anderson's book. I, I remember that uh, it is obviously an outstanding contribution to that. Although, uh, as, as I hinted, I, I had some criticism. I, I did actually write a review of it at, at the time. But, and I think, I, I don't remember exactly um, what exactly it, it was I didn't like, but I think it, it was what I, uh, what, I, what I just said, that I think it is not so much a question of chronology in, in Marx, a clear development. It, it is more a question of different types of texts emphasizing different aspects of the same ambiguity that there is in Marx. I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not totally sure, uh, but that, that is not really a huge uh, disagreement. So it's it's a, certainly a, a matter of nuance, <laughs> perhaps, in how to read this. Um, I don't admit any weakness. Well, uh, <laughs> in in the manifesto. Well, I'm I am totally fascinated by by the manifesto because, um, obviously, on the one hand, it is a handy summary in in a way of the German ideology and other things that 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 are kind of I, I think they are con in in such a condensed and such beautifully written form. They're kind of uh, cramming in uh, a, a lot of the of, of their uh, writing that precedes the manifesto, and what I find uh, amazing is how how negative it is. So the um, first of all, the whole catalog of how not to do it that that to me is extremely interesting, and um, it seems to be extremely important. Uh, the, uh, the, the obviously both spent uh, substantial parts of their life's work on critiquing uh, other socialists. So that was a very central aspect. And in that sense, uh, that is, uh, in that literal sense, that is a critical theory because it very much operates in the form of critiquing fellow socialists. Uh, and that, that seems to be quite an important thing. And that is obviously quite central to the manifesto in, in the uh, especially in the third part. So I, I think that is uh, extremely important for contemporary questions because there's, there's a lot to learn from there, how, how to position or how, how to understand what that thing that they call the Communist Party, which wasn't a party at all in the, in the manifesto. Basically, it's, I mean, it's, it's so crazy. It's a manifesto for a party that basically says that there shouldn't be a party everything but not a party uh, so there's so many crazy things going on there and that is that is part of what fascinates me with that text um and 
then obviously the if you just look at the first part the uh, what is often described as the celebration of the bourgeoisie obviously it is totally sarcastic it is it is at the same time incredibly sarcastic and funny uh, and uh, but it is also true so, so the things he is saying there, I mean, they're, they're obviously, I, I've, oh, I think you are probably hinting at the things about the Chinese walls that need to be battered down. And, and, and uh, I think there's something in the context where he mentions the battering down of Chinese walls, that the, the obstinate hatred of foreigners or something. I, I think this is how they see China. I mean, obviously, this is, um, that's just racist, yeah. So that is no doubt about that. And there's, there's, but there's a lot of this stuff in Marx and Engels's writings. It's everywhere. So the, obviously, people have written whole books about just collecting the the kind of really unpleasant language that you find here, there, and everywhere. Um, so I take that for granted that we are more or less familiar with that. So I'm, um, and uh, I, I would want to. Uh, I would want these things to be part of the text that is to be analyzed. So they, they, they have to be there also to show the limitations. But uh, in spite of all the limitations, it, it is there's completely explosive stuff in there that is um, hasn't even been repeated by anyone uh, in, in that level of um, clarity and, and but, but it's a mixed yeah it's a mixed bag as every text is so so there is no text by the very nature of being a text <laughs> I think uh, texts are contradictory and, and as such we have to work them through so that that's what we do as interpreters of texts um, that's so I have no uh, yeah I, have, I don't think I'm I, I'm not I don't think we're disagreeing on, on any of that. With the nationalism, I, I didn't equate anti-Semitism with nationalism. Um, uh, what I probably, uh, what you're probably referring to is that historically, uh, the political anti-Semitism of the last third of the 19th century emerges in the context of nationalism. So that is that is simply a historical. Uh, observation and the logic of that type of anti-Semitism very clearly comes out of the concerns of nation building, uh, uh, nation consolidation in that period. And, and that is not just in Germany, that is in, uh, in uh, all over Europe. You, you, can, um, you, you can chart the development of, of anti-Semitic positions out of the specifics of how nation building and nationalist movements evolve and, and how they articulate their policies and, and what their, uh, if you like, this, the social content of that nationalism is. And this is what you're hinting at. So you're saying the struggles of oppressed nations and uh, post-colonial context, etc. Well, that is um, exactly what Marx describes uh, so this is one of the, these these um, national liberation struggles I would interpret as struggles led by uh, uh, local bourgeoisies that are trying to install or they're trying to transform a given colonial or imperial structure of of governance as well as a societal economic structure uh, with, a, with a modern bourgeois state, basically. So that, that is what um, national liberation means. Replace the, the uh, strange forms of modern society and, and governance, society and state, uh, replace these with kind of proper modern bourgeois forms of state and society, uh, which Basically, um, well, there is of course no moral or philosophical position from which to say, "Oh no, you shouldn't do that." <laughs> uh, this is what the bourgeoisies in these places have to do. The question is, from a communist perspective, uh, how do you relate to that? 
And if you take the position of the manifesto, obviously, uh, Marx and Engels in that particular moment totally dogmatically uh, uphold the position that the bourgeoisie has to be helped in this process. So if you take February 1848 as the Marx Engels position on that, then you could easily um, find, you could enlist them, Marx Engels February 48, you could enlist them for any uh, anti colonial nationalist liberation movement anywhere. <laughs> However, that is just one moment. And uh, Marx Engels very quickly, even later in the same year, realized that the strategy didn't work. So the, uh, if you like, tactical or strategic support of the communist groupuscules of, of, of the time for the liberal bourgeoisie basically backfired because the liberal bourgeoisie uh, was not remotely interested in being supported by Marx and Engels and others like them. Uh, they had other plans. And uh, that's how history actually played out. And they realized that very quickly and they changed their position on that. Uh, so from that, I would derive that you have to look at on a case-to-case -case basis, what is actually the social content of any particular anti-colonial and uh, national liberation um, struggle and movement. And you have to decide on a case-to-case -case base what is in there that is positive and to be supported and what is in there that is to be resisted. And uh, I, I suspect the majority of cases, there's probably more to be resisted, including capitalism, <laughs> uh, which is the principal project. No, but what they do is to, to create political forms that are adequate for participation in the capitalist world system from the perspective of a particular uh, place on if you like, the periphery of the world system and to improve their role within the capitalist world system, that that's what they're doing. And as I said, there's absolutely no moral ground for saying, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. But uh, politically, from a Marxian or communist perspective, there's any number of reasons to uh, support some things and not to support others. And probably, uh, obviously, this is an empirical question that needs to be discussed on a case-to-case -case basis, as is exactly what Marx and Engels were doing. So they were supporting the Irish very enthusiastically, <laughs> but not supporting, I, I think, Hungarians. Uh, they, they didn't like Hungarians very much for, for whatever reason. So uh, obviously, there are, there's a whole literature and on why they were right or wrong in, in every particular case where they made that judgment, which, which to me is a question for historians. From a theoretical perspective, what matters is to look at how do they argue, whether they are actually right or wrong is almost secondary there, because that's history. But uh, to look at what is the patterns of the argument, and the pattern of the argument is, does Irish nationalism help the emancipation of the working class in a universal perspective? And the answer was, yes, it does for such and such and such reasons. That's the way to go about it. And, and I think that is simply still the way to go about it. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you. And uh, we have now Paul Zarebka. Uh, Paul, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, Marcel, I, I really appreciate your talk because actually you. you are into areas that I'm not into. Okay, so uh, it's educational for me, but I do have two questions. Uh, one is, I you spent uh, quite a few references to anti-Semitism in your talk, and I would just say for myself, I don't think that is any longer the leading issue in the world today. Um, it, of course, it was. <laughs> In the 1930s and 40s, but I don't. I just don't think that's that's where we're at today. Now you probably don't agree with me, so I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on that. And the second thing is a completely different question, and that is that Marx spent a, an awful amount of time on political economy, 
and I would like you to situate that work by Marx. Why is it, why was why from your point of view did Marx spend so much time on political economy? Yeah, thank you. Uh, on the first question, uh, I think your formulation was that anti-Semitism is not the leading issue, uh, with which I would agree. I don't think there is the leading issue or any very specific uh, issue cannot be the leading issue. What I would argue, and, and that is uh, uh, quite a lot of my, if you like, um, yeah, quite a lot of my, my work is in, in that area. Uh, I, I do think that there are um, elements of anti-Semitism in, in a variety um, in, in a variety of contexts um, and the, 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 the importance is uh, that anti-Semitism is an element that allows sort of that, that operates like a bridgehead for some people on the left to cross over to the right and, and that is something that you can empirically observe uh, also over the last half century so there's 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 people who um, come from a left position and because they somehow um, get into the sort of train of thought in, into the anti-semitic train of thought that allows them or that is the bridge over which they cross over uh, to the far right. And usually people who are on the far left, well, sometimes they become Democrats and, and uh, Habermasians and uh, sort of liberals of some sort. But very often, uh, once you, if, you, if you are a radical, then uh, <laughs> you're, you're becoming a radical again. So that's, that's why uh, some, of, um, some people uh, cross over from uh, the far left to the far right. And that is... Uh, that is an extremely dangerous thing, although I would not claim that it is the lead issue, but it is a, uh, it is a hugely um, disconcerting phenomenon. Um, be because it, it creates, it, it's, um, it muddies the waters. So, so at the, at the very least, but it does, it, it muddies the waters uh, and makes um, more difficult. So if, if you're not addressing this issue, it makes it much more difficult to, to articulate what is actually the distinction between far right critique or apparent critique of capitalism or capitalist modernity, usually articulated in the form of anti-liberalism and uh, an emancipatory left wing critique of capitalism and liberalism and and uh, capitalist modernity as, as an entire package, if you like. So if you're not addressing what is sort of the gray area through which some individuals walk from one to the other, if you don't address that, then you are um, much more vulnerable to... Um, but you have other, I mean, you have homophobia, you have Islamophobia, you have yeah. other issues, you have other bridges than yep. just anti-Semitism this bridge. That's, I agree, that's yes. Question. Okay. Uh, there, there would probably be historical reasons why simply empirically, in, in theory, I totally agree. And uh, um, as, as I said earlier, the conservative revolution was totally obsessed with gender as much as with Jews. And partly one, one of the one aspect of the anti-Semitism was that the Jews muddy the gender order. And this is exactly as, as, as you mentioned, homophobia, that is, that is exactly one of those interesting overlapping, um, interesting points of an overlap where, where anti-Semitism is uh, for people in various political um, camps, if you like, to, to express their, um, their resentment against the, what they perceive as a dissolution of the, of the gender order and the, and the order of sexualities and, and, and so on. And you, you will very often actually find that, they are, uh, that there is an 
anti-Jewish trait to the rejection or to, to, to the rejection of, um, say, um, uh, gay emancipation. So they actually make that connection. And that, that would be the reason to, to deal with that because um, you will actually empirically find these, these things. But um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that is a satisfactory answer. What was the other question? Uh, I can't... Why Marx put so much emphasis on oh. work in political economy? Because I think uh, the what gets him there is the understanding that mod modernity has a specific dynamism to it that no other period of history had. So modernity is dynamic in a way that is unprecedented. And he wanted to figure out what is the engine at the heart of modernity that drives this dynamism? What makes modernity so incomparably dynamic? And that is capital. So he sat down to understand what is this capital actually? I think that is that is the that would be the link. So I think Marx starts out from the question, as did Adam Smith, what is this thing, modern society? strange new thing what what is it and the critique of political economy is the answer to that question okay <laughs> all right um and we have also the next question from christina um master oh christina uh, can you can you uh, read out your question Oh no, your your mic. Ah, okay. I couldn't unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, I I just meant to sort of comment on the whole discussion about well, why should the anti-Semitism be relevant as a bridge point from the left to the right? And I was wondering if one reason that makes it in that function more important than misogyny, other forms of racism, and so on, is that the specific content of anti-Semitism is usually that it passes itself off as a revolt against those in power, or even as a form of mis misunderstood sort of anti-capitalism. So that while, of course, there is also racism, anti-Muslim racism, misogyny, and so on on the left, that is generally a, a much less of an issue. But it's perfectly, if you have a bad analysis of capitalism, it's it's much easier to be a leftist anti-Semite than it is to be a leftist racist or a less leftist misogynist. So I was wondering if that plays a role for your, um, yeah, picking out anti-Semitism as one issue in that context. Well, I would actually say that um, misogyny also articulates itself as a, am I on actually? Yes, we are on. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, uh, misogyny also articulates itself quite often as a protest against those in power because the the misogynists, the uh, what are they? I'm not mentioning any names now. Uh, they seem to fantasize that women rule the world. No, so I, I think I, I slightly disagree. Actually, I, I think that that's why I would not say that anti-Semitism is actually the lead issue. So the uh, I mean, in the, I'm, I'm inclining to, <laughs> it might sound a bit strange, but uh, I'm actually inclined to say that the question of patriarchy is ultimately in the, in the larger, uh, in the larger perspective, if there is any lead issue, then it would be that, because that is characteristic of the, uh, for want of a better word, the, the deep, the deep structure of our civilization as a whole. Uh, which anti-Semitism obviously isn't, that reaches back barely 3,000 years or 2,500 or whatever, depends who you're asking. Uh, well, but... for me to undermine the anti-misogynist <laughs> struggle. But, well, I just meant in this specific argument that this is a sort of slippery slope from the left to the right. I mean, I, I certainly am more aware of mm. um, leftist anti-Semites than I am of misogyny being is even though it is but you know i think it's yep. it's usually more criticized from within the left um than be, because it's well 
again, anyway, we could sort of have a long debate on what is the sort of leading trope or, or leading imagery of women in misogynist. I don't think it matters what is the leading. Yeah, no, I mean, I would want it, uh, to have it as a sort of competition anyway, because that wouldn't make any sense. But um, yeah, I think it's easier to be an anti-Semite and on the left than to be, say, an, a racist um, in the sense of colonial racism and to be on the left. But anyway, just thanks for <laughs> thanks for your input. I, yes. And uh, the question and uh, also the point which Marcel uh, emphasized uh, at, at the latest part of his uh, uh, presentation reminds me uh, two things, two things which happen now. First, uh, there, is a, there is a very uh, big danger there is a very big da da ra danger in racism in the USA. So uh, after COVID-19, there is a big increasing uh, hate crimes against Asian people. And in Korea, we see every day news from the, from the USA. Uh, there's a hate, there are hate crimes, but in most cases, black people Black people hit Asian. Black people hit Asians. Black people who all, who are suffering from racism hit also vulnerable uh, Asian people. And in Korea, in in Korea, the young generations, young generations, twenty years old or some young generations, especially men, 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 they are they have very strong tendency of misogyny and they have very strong tendency of anti-feminism. So it's a, it's a very big uh, 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 issue in Korea. So I think your question is valid. Why people support wrong criticisms? Wrong criticisms, they are suffering from capitalism and they are suffering from this system, but they hate or they even attack the, the more vulnerable people. Marcel, what do, what do we have to do in this situation? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so the, um, to, the, it would be interesting to see um, how this violence is articulated or, or kind of uh, how, how the reasoning about this violence looks like so so i could imagine I've, I've i've no idea i'm just guessing that these um instances of um maybe uh um, um anti-asian uh, violence does does that come with a suggestion that they are they have it too good or that they are too well established or too powerful or, or so, in which case there, there would perhaps be an, an echo of or a parallel uh, to, to anti-Semitic violence. I, I could imagine that might well be the case. Well. Well, uh, uh, no, I mean, I mean, in the street, the the in the in the in the on the street, there's there are uh, violences against Asian people, no without reason. <laughs> I mean, this situation. Yeah. But you really think it's it's blacks who are doing that against Asians? I mean, the, that where did you? I mean, I don't hear that in the United States. That it's blacks who are attacking Asians, but you say that you are reading that in South Korea. Um, yeah, yes, yes. In many in many cases, I mean not all, but in many cases, the uh, yes, the criminals, uh, the 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 op uh, op offensives are uh, racial. Uh, Black people or Latin people, almost uh, black people. So I mean, 
I mean, it's a very tragic, tragic situation. Tragic situation with, with the people who are suffering from racism attacks another racial minorities. This is my uh, okay. Well, excuse excuse me for my short English. Yeah. Did you understand? Uh, you know, I, I I understand. Yeah, I just didn't realize. Um, I have to watch the news a bit more carefully in my own country. I would not have. I didn't have that perspective. Okay. And I, I couldn't possibly comment, so I know nothing about it, but I do recall that historically, like in uh, literature about um, certain urban riots in, in, in the US, there was a narrative that uh, various um, urban, very poor people, which in U.S. cities just happen to be very often black or Latino or, or, and so on, uh, would attack uh, uh, Asian people f on the grounds that they are shopkeepers or something. So there's a, the, the, I vaguely recall that there, is a, or there was a narrative, at least in, in those earlier contexts, uh, that they would be singled out as a representative of, if you like, power in, in, in that sense, because they are... As, as shopkeepers, uh, probably in the particular neighborhood in question, uh, perceived as being in a in a in a better position. So so and and the uh, the racism and the violence might be articulated in that form. In in a sort of, I think there was a technical term for that middleman racism, which is from the scholarship on, on racism from the 1950s uh, that, um, that that was at the time used to address both some forms of anti-Semitism and some other forms of, of, uh, of racial violence and prejudice, um, which, which relates to this phenomenon. Also, also in other countries, so in uh, anti-Chinese riots in um, I think in some um, Southeast Asian countries, I, I don't recall the exact context, but I think you get the idea. So the, if the main issue, and that's, that's what Christina raised, is the question of the racial violence in their own mind being motivated as a rebellion against power of some form. So this can take all kinds of forms. Uh, and that is not exclusively something to do with anti-Semitism, obviously. So, okay. but <laughs> all right. Uh, are there any further questions, or should we close? If not, okay, we we can now finish our discussions. Okay. Thank you very much for participating, and uh, thank you very much, Marcel. Thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much, everyone. And see you next time. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Master. Thank you.